This is Life, Body, Business, Impact with Fatima. Welcome, friends. I am so grateful to have you here. I'm your host, Fatima Ingalls, fitness expert, best-selling author, lifestyle entrepreneur, founder of the Life, Body, Business, Fit Systems, and co-founder of the amazing Freedom Retreats. My mission is to positively impact 10 million lives, to inspire you to wake up and live from your bucket list of dreams instead of waking up one day with a bucket list of regrets. Get ready to be inspired with weekly episodes and interviews that disrupt your thinking and motivate you to build your best life, body and business. To change one life is to change many. So come with me now and let's get started with yours. Hey there, beautiful people. Thank you for joining us for another episode. Today, I'm chatting with Lisa Fife. Lisa is an avid sportswoman and athlete, playing high-level netball and being the vice captain of the Ladies Gridiron League here in Australia. She is an entrepreneur, owner of a very successful F45 gym, and she's also recently become a mum. So we talk about all sorts of challenges that you face trying to juggle all those sorts of things. We discuss the fact that she lost her mum to motor neuron disease um, between the age of 15 to 21. Lisa had to take care and watch her mum deteriorate. The importance of putting yourself out there and and looking for opportunities and creating opportunities in your life and making the sacrifices to turn your dreams into a reality, doing the actual hard work. So why don't we jump into the episode? Hi, Lisa. How are you going? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. Oh, that's okay. It's uh, something that's very new to me. So yeah, uh, definitely ticking something off, off the bucket list here. Well, it's all about getting out the comfort zone, right? You know quite a lot about that, don't you? 100%. 100%. That's actually, yeah, one of the things I live by is you can't you can't really grow if you're not outside your comfort zone. So just say yes, do it, and that's one, it. Yeah, I completely um, live by that same, that same thought as well. So why don't we start by telling our listeners a little bit about your journey. So you own an F45 gym, a highly successful one in a regional area now. You're a mum to a beautiful little baby. Tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are now. All right. So, you just want me to, I guess, lay it all on the line and then dissect from there. Do you want to? Just yeah, a just, long just line? A, yeah. yeah, just in a minute or two, if you can yeah. tell us the, the journey of Lisa to where you are now and how you have become an athlete, and and we'll take it from there. Yeah. So, um, I was born in the Adelaide Hills. Um, my parents split up when I was quite young. Um, I've got no idea how young it was, um, but I was definitely very. My mum pushed me, well, not pushed me, but put me into a lot of sports from a very young age with, I guess, gymnastics and and netball. I then hit a bit of a hard spot in my life with my mum got really unwell um, when I was a teen and then she ended up passing away when a bit before I was 21. So throughout that stage, I was also gunning for a netball career that also didn't eventuate. I guess we'll probably go into a little bit of that after as to why that sort of didn't eventuate. And then from there, um, there's a bit of a backstory with relationships and I was in a really long term relationship that um, not with that person still now split up. Now in a new relationship, a new area. Um, I live um, down in Mount Gambia, which is five hours away um, from where I used to live. So I'm away from my family and that. And then, yeah, own all of a sudden own 45 down here. And, yeah, basically just started with a really clean slate. So that's, I guess, it in a nutshell. Oh, and have a baby, yeah. Yes, <laughs> you, yep, you do have a baby <laughs> who's beautifully sleeping in the background yeah. now. So, And how old is he now? Uh, he's almost 11 months. 11 months old. So we'll chat a little bit about that as well because you're obviously juggling motherhood and running your business. Sure am. Sure Which am. Also, yeah, also brings a whole whole other um, group of challenges along it the way. It does. I remember when you asked me to do this podcast and I said I didn't think I was very interesting. <laughs> you, you start thinking about what you've done and it's like, oh, yeah, I guess I guess there are some things in there that, that, are, that are good to talk about. Yeah, you've got nuggets of wisdom to, to share with other people who are, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started this interview about the things that so many of us are facing and the same sorts of challenges, you know, fear of fear of failure, fear of um, procrastination, like trying to get into good habits and routines, trying to juggle all the things that we have to juggle on a day-to-day basis, whether you're a parent or not, because even if you're not a parent, you're filling your life up with other things that you're trying to achieve and other commitments. So we're all busy people. Oh, I just, for sure. I just want to acknowledge, you know, you, you said your mum passed away at 21. So I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know that. And I'm sorry that, you know, you had to go through that. That would yeah. definitely have been... A tough thing. How did you cope as a 21-year-old who uh, had her eyes set on a career in netball and your mum did an amazing thing by putting you into sport from a young age? What happened there with your netball career? Yes. And how, so, what you were trying to um, achieve? 
it, she had like a, um, it was never diagnosed as motor neurone disease, but whenever I see anybody with motor neurone disease, that's exactly what she looked like. I'm unsure back then. I don't know if maybe it wasn't something that was as easy to diagnose or I believe there's stuff that's in, this, in a similar family, but she basically went through with an, an undiagnosed. So the doctors couldn't exactly say what it was, um, except the fact that she was going to die. So that came on we believe after she had a car accident, so someone crashed into the back of her. It wasn't anything like an actual horrific car accident. It was just a, in the wet weather, someone hit the rear of her car. And then she had a lot of neck problems from there. And we believe that it started from that. But the doctors refused to say that that was the case. So whether it was linked or not um, is a whole another thing. And, um, yeah, and so that started probably when I remember when I was about 15 and I know that it was even before that and often with neurological things like they can take time and so as far as I'm aware she battled with problems for about eight years where they progressively got worse and worse and worse so it started um, with her getting a bit of vertigo um, and the main big problem that we knew something really wasn't right was we had a walk-in pantry and she'd walk in and then all of a sudden the messages wouldn't get through from her brain to her body to tell her to turn around and come back out again. So she, she couldn't turn around, basically. And then from there, things just went really downhill, couldn't walk, um, and then became confined to a chair and then her bed. And, yeah, in the last sort of few or oh, six months, even years of her life, like she couldn't even talk. Um, we communicated through blinking. It was absolutely horrific. And so from me being in state sports, from a uh, state netball from 15, 17s, Tried out for 19s, but I didn't. I think I made a reserve because my life was just falling apart on the outside. And I made Staffy, which is a South Australian Sports Institute, and I ended up quitting that. Um, and it's just looking back, it all just, I didn't have that outside support. And because it was just me and my mum and my little brother living together, like it wasn't, I wasn't relied on to care for her because we had outside help. But at nighttime, like I was the one that was helping her get up and, and taking her to the toilet in the middle of the night. And then I had to be up at 5 a.m. living in the Adelaide Hills to drive um, 40 k's to to be at weights training at 6 o'clock in the morning and that kind of thing. So the wheels just really fell off for me. I regret oh, – I watch netball now on TV and I just wish I was able to do it, but I don't have – I guess I don't have regrets because it probably just wasn't going to be possible. So, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's It must have been it. frightening to for your mum to be going through that, but for you as a 15-year-old – um, and up until you're 21, watching your mum go through all of this. Oh, it was, it's it's terrible. And knowing now that there's still for that kind of thing, no cure, it just makes me feel physically sick, just knowing that there's other people that do go through that. I know at the time you're just in survival mode as well. Like you, you in a way, you desensitise to it because you are so used to seeing that every day. And one of the hardest things for me was still doing my own things on the outside and knowing that she was sort of stuck at home in bed and, and like not even able to change like the, the TV channel or anything. So yeah, it was hard. Yeah, that would have definitely been, um, definitely been a struggle. I can't imagine what that would have been like for you. Yeah. In relation to the MND, you mentioned that there is still no cure. Does the way people, you know, live their life in terms of their, what they eat and exercise, can that impact at all? whether you get it or not? Look, I I have no idea. I have, to be perfectly honest, I've only just started becoming a little bit more involved with knowing a bit more about it within the last year. I think before that, I shut myself away from it because one, I honestly don't even want to know if it's genetic, whatever she had or not. I would, I would rather not know because if, yeah, I can't even imagine if I started getting those symptoms where, where my mind or something would go because I've seen what firsthand what can happen but yeah as far as I'm pretty sure with MND there's no known cause no known cure and that's why it's such a terrible terrible disease and so yeah but I do 100% with everything believe that exercising leading a healthy lifestyle mind body um, will give you the best chance at anything because there are so many nasties out there but yeah I don't know for sure but 100% living a healthy lifestyle you're giving yourself the best shot at not yeah, having absolutely, anything. Absolutely, absolutely agree with that in terms of any sort of disease out there that, you know, to give yourself the best shot, you want to look after yourself physically, mentally and emotionally. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, even with things like I notice when I'm um, fit and strong and healthy and if you happen to get a cold or anything like that, like my body, when I'm doing, like I definitely fall off the wagon with these things, but I know when As I'm we all do. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eating well, drinking lots of water, um, exercising. If I get a cold or anything, what I notice is I just get a bit of a sniffle, a bit of a sore throat, 
um, and my body I can feel is really fighting it off. But if I'm not and something like that comes along, totally different. So I think, yeah, it's just yeah, super important to live that think- um, healthy lifestyle. That's a great point. And I really like that you've been open and shared that because so often as health and fitness professionals, our clients and people from the external will look to you and go, oh, well, you know, you don't eat this way or you don't fall off the bandwagon. This is just what you do every single day. And honestly, it's certainly not the case for me. For example, I haven't been to the gym all week. So it's Wednesday today. There's no way I'm going to make it there today with my (laughs) schedule. And I went and danced. I did my first hip hop dancing class, which was really more comedy (laughs) on Monday night, right? But I would love to be at the gym and eating perfectly this week, but I've got other goals and sometimes, you know, other priorities, um, you know, take priority. Take essentially. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. So I think it's important for people to be aware that that happens for, for all of us, even people in the health and fitness industry. Sure does. I really find something that I battle with that I've found being someone who owns a gym and also being a mum is I bounce back quite well um, from my pregnancy and a lot of people always, or not always, but a lot of things that I've had come at me is you've, it's easy for you because of this or you've bounced back well or like, yeah, basically just saying that it's easy for you. But I've found that leading a healthy lifestyle for a long period of time, yes, has helped me and it allows me to be able to fall off the bandwagon at times and get back on um, and it not be me falling into a huge hole. But it's just consistency over an extremely long period of time. Um, And, yeah, just not – and then allowing myself to fall off and and it's okay. That is a really, really important message right there. Consistency over a long period of time is what works. So it's not about that that quick fix. It's not about, you know, in – 10 weeks or 12 weeks, we can, sure, you can make a lot of changes, yeah. but to maintain those changes, we need to be consistent. And you do fall off the bandwagon. It, you will 100% fall off the bandwagon, but it's how quickly you get back on that bandwagon, which is going to make all the difference. So definitely. in relation to the comment about bouncing back from pregnancy, I know you were talking physically. How about mentally? Did you have any other challenges after pregnancy to bounce back that people maybe didn't know about? Probably the biggest challenge that I have faced with having a baby is slowing down and things just not happening as fast as I would expect them to. And obviously when you you have a baby and you're working, like I did take the maternity leave, um, the government maternity leave. So I chose not to work for a period of time, but in your mind, like work's always going in the back of your mind, but I just definitely found the struggle of slowing everything down and yeah, things just not happening as fast and so not getting out the door as fast and not getting housework done as fast and things like that. And Huey didn't sleep very well in the beginning. And I've always been a really good sleeper. And I hit a really, really bad patch there for a while just to do with, I'm pretty sure it was all just sleep deprivation. I did, I did question myself if I was heading down that postnatal depression side, but I, I was able to pull myself out each time. And Josh was just working away. He worked one week on, one week off. And there was just some really hard times in there. But definitely mentally, that was the the hardest thing I'd ever been through was the sleep deprivation. And um, But being able to take time away from work helped. But yeah, oh, I've, I've been, I was in a bit of a hole back then, that's for sure. I'm sure that there are people listening right now that are going, not in a, not in a bad way, like, oh my God, great. We have also had those sorts of challenges because from the outside looking in, sometimes people look at success and they think it's been easy when oh, yeah. we've all got different challenges. We're all on different journeys. And just because you don't see them doesn't mean we're not fighting with them internally. Yeah. I popped a um, post up. Like I um, use my Instagram a lot, but I actually just was looking the other day and I realized I don't post a whole lot, but um, <laughs> I use it more for looking at other things. But I did do a post at one point and I just detailed, I guess, what I just explained there that I was really struggling and going through a bit of a dark time and just, yeah, really sleep deprived. And when I put that post up, like it just went gangbusters and I had so many people inbox me and people just respond and and relate and just say even like some just said, hey, keep going. Others were like, oh, my God, I'm going through that as well. And, and yeah, it was – it didn't surprise me. It shocked me how much of a response I got, but it didn't surprise me um, to hear that a lot of other people go through that as well because, yeah, it can be a dark, lonely place at – 4 a.m. when your baby's screaming and you're on your own or um. definitely and it can be if you think that you're going through it on your own and that maybe you're doing something wrong whatever it is in life if you feel like you're going through a struggle on your own like I've spoken to people on the show who have had suicide uh, suicidal inclinations and Mm. um, one of my guests Mike Maisie actually did um, attempt suicide while in prison and was lucky Mm. to be cut down so we all go through these different types of challenges and you feel like you're alone but the beauty in sharing stories and 
sharing experiences like we do here is that, and like you did on your on your Instagram, is that other people go, oh, my God, I can relate to that. Like you said, this is relatable and I'm not the only one going through this struggle. So you can, um, I guess, reach out and ask for help. So what I'd like to do now is just shift focus a little bit to talk mm-hmm. about your um, athlete, your career as an athlete, not just in netball, but when you were in the ladies gridiron. Yeah. So then, then we'll chat about your business. Yeah. So that randomly came about. <laughs> um, this will probably come up a little bit in our chat is that I'm super spontaneous. Um, hence why we couldn't talk last week because I booked a Bali trip like two days in, with like a booked flights. Two days and I love I that, right? <laughs> Listen, guys, um, Lisa sent me a message and she's, I think you were on the way from Mount Gambia to Adelaide, which is like about a five yeah. or six hour drive, right? Yeah. We had this interview booked and Lisa's like, oh, I've just had, you know, a little bit of time and I've just booked myself a trip to Bali. Um so can we reschedule or can we do it while I'm open? Bali, I'm like, oh, my God, I love that. I love that you have created a life where you're actually able to do that. I know. I'm definitely very, very lucky. I mean, luck, luck that's another interesting word, luck. But I have worked very hard for it and I'm very thankful that I was able um, to do that. Um, but, yeah, in my life, everything's just done on a whim. So, yeah, you'll probably learn that at other points. So going back to the football thing, that sort of ties in with that spontaneity was I – so when would I have started that? I can't remember how old I was, but I'd gone after not being – after deciding netball wasn't going to go through because I um, ended up going back – after my mum passed away, I went back and played um, state league, uh, I think it was in reserves, down in Adelaide and had an awesome season and then was going into the second season and looking at possibly progressing a bit further into the um, ANL league, which was the next league above that. Next season, first game, first quarter, rolled my ankle so bad and – took out every ligament in my ankle and it was just oh ouch yeah never really gotten perfect again from that and then that just basically sent me into nah that's it I'm done I think I had a year off I made it back that season and then I think I had a year off after that and I decided that Adelaide like in town net wasn't for me and I went back up to my grassroots in the Adelaide Hills um and they had a great league competition up there so went back up with all of the girls I've played against since like under 11s which was awesome and then one night I was just on Facebook and I saw this thing pop up and it was tryouts for the Women's Gridiron League, so what was the Lingerie Football League in America. And it was – they were bring, I think they'd already run a season in Australia, but it was on the East Coast, so I'd never even heard of it um, until then. And the tryouts were the next day. And so I just signed up and I was like <laughs> – Oh, my God, you signed up the day before? Yeah, and then I went to trials the next day. (laughs) Actually, no, I couldn't go to trials the next day because I had a net. It was on a Saturday. That was a Friday night, and I'm pretty sure it was a Saturday. And so I couldn't go, and then I messaged, and I gave them my background. And, yeah, just one of those things, like women's AFL or anything wasn't around then, and I guess it was just one of those opportunities in sport. Like, I'm very just put yourself out there and give anything a crack and it was just something that, like, I've grown up with all boys and rough and tumble, and to be able to play gridiron, I was like, give me a crack at that. And so I went and tried out. And you made it in. And what position were you in? And guys so, and girls, she looked amazing. Like, Lisa is an incredible athlete, but, man, did you rock your gridiron outfit, uniform. <laughs> definitely. So there's a bit of a story with how that the whole leagues went, and I could go on for hours about it, and it wasn't um, all positive, but – to begin with, went out to trials and background wise, like chuck me in any sport and I'll give it a crack. And when you're obviously trying out for something, it's very early days. And so I didn't necessarily get put into a into a spot to begin, but I was straight into the team and I knew that with the people that um, were trying out, I was definitely one of the leaders there. It was a bit of a smaller group. And then basically from there, probably within the first couple of weeks, it was decided that I would be the quarterback, which I'd heard that term before, but American football, like, I've seen it on TV and I always just used to turn it off because I didn't understand it. And so it was the most, in my sporting career, the most stressful time of my whole entire life, having to learn a a new sport that is incredibly, incredibly in-depth and complex. And the position that I was to play, which is the quarterback, is you coordinate everything. So you're not just learning a position, um, a set position where this is what you've got to do. You have to learn everything. And at that stage, we were possibly going to be playing on TV within five months, which thankfully didn't eventuate because I don't know how that would humanly be possible. And why that didn't eventuate was the LFL was an American company and apparently the year before 
it had been run by the American company and then they cancelled our season. I'm just trying to remember because it was quite a long time ago now. I'm just re-jogging my brain as we go. Um, they cancelled our season right a week or two before it was meant to start and then they said, all right, now you've got to train for another year or two before we decide to put it back in again. Um, as and in it on was, TV or? Yeah, not like, at all. On elite. TV and, and all, uh, all together. Okay. And so it was kind of like, okay, um, it, it was new and exciting at that time. So I was just kind of going along with it. And I was in a really good position, um, uh, like with, as in, in the team, but in a enjoyable position as well. So I kind of was like, right, I'll go down whatever path is needed because it was a lot of fun and really enjoyed it. And then some people who from Australia who were a part of the season before wanted to create an Australian league similar and run it and similar, but get us on the field earlier. And then what happened was we were presented with this option as a team. It became this huge mess. We were presented as an option as a team to either sign new contracts with this Australian league and ditch the American league, or we could stay with the American league, but 90% of people were moving over to this Australian league, but my doors were potentially open to begin with to be going over to America and playing over there with the skill that I had. Um, so I'd, been scouted already to possibly be going over to America and we were guided by um, our coach and that and um, and our assistant staff and it was just a huge mess and basically in the end it was decided by the team that we were best to go over to the Australian League because what was also going to happen was they were going to take I guess with the the American side being called the lingerie football league, it wasn't going to be lingerie anymore. We were kind of going into shorts and different things like that, and it was sold to us really well and be focused more on on the on the sport and less about the women or um, yeah whatever it was all about there. And so we ended up changing over to the Australian league. But what I guess the bottom line was, and we we weren't to know this, was that really there wasn't the backing behind it, so the sponsorship and the money and all of that required to run a successful season. And they got us on the field early, and we had an amazing season, and it was so much fun. It did end up going on Foxtel some of the games, and that's that's awesome. Like that's that's something yeah, that that's to be nice. a part of. But then it all just fell in a heap from there. And as soon as we signed those Australian contacts, we uh, contracts we got completely banished from the American League and it just become very messy and something that I just it was quite toxic and so once we'd finished our first season I also was at that point where I had the possibility of moving down here and I just basically decided that I didn't have the energy or the time to put into pushing that league forward and I just especially didn't. without without the financial backing and, and oh, sponsorship it's already harder for women it was a mess and the women's AFL was just coming in and that was just looking amazing. Um, in our grand final, I sustained an injury to my knee that still is bothering me now. I've got a, um, under my patella, so your kneecap, there's cartilage under there and I've got a full thickness tear, so meaning it's through to the bone. But a clean out won't help her. I'm going to look at possibly now getting some um, PRP injections, I think they are, because it still bothers me now. And so for me, it was just like, I think I'm done. <laughs> I yeah. just didn't well, it was a very that 18 months was I think it was 18 months in total was yeah hands down aside from that time that I went through with my mum and that that was the most stressful demanding time because I was also playing league netball up in the hills as well so okay. two sports training I think I had 11 training sessions that I had each week of between weights and cardio you so and games woman so um, yeah I was so fit <laughs> yeah well you from from how long I've known you, you've always been, you know, quite quite fit and quite strong. Do you have any regrets for having gone into the league and having said yes and putting yourself out there for that opportunity? Because I'm sure you've got lessons that you've taken out of that. What are they? Yeah, I guess probably the biggest thing that I, as an athlete, I've always learned is 100% being outside your comfort zone is the only place that you can grow. So saying yes to an opportunity, one of my favourite quotes is like a Richard Branson quote. It says something about, can't quote it exactly. So something about if you're presented with an opportunity and you don't know how to do it, just say yes and figure it out later. I love um, that quote. It's amazing because that's just me to a T. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like with football, like obviously netball, I grew up with that, learned it as you go. But with football, like I learned a whole new position. Um, I learned many new positions. And um, the only thing that I did get out of uh, negative out of that was the people who didn't agree with that sport as a whole because of the the female. Um, 
I guess, sexuality side of it with the uniforms and that. Um, and everyone just said to uh, anyone who questioned me on it, like, I guess I just said, like, I'm comfortable with my body. I've got an opportunity to play a new sport um, at a at a state level, at the national levels, because we were playing against other states. Like, why wouldn't I say yes? Um, and so, yeah, there were people that definitely did um, did not it ever agree. get you down because because people are always judging and, you know, we're all on social media and things these days, whether it is personally or for your business, there's always a lot of judgment. So definitely, I like to say, obviously, people are entitled to their opinions. I don't have to agree with them, right? Um, no. But it does get it does get to people. So did it did it really get you down? No, nah, I, I think I'm a very strong willed person. Um, there were things like we had a, <laughs> always laugh about this. I thought about this the other day. We had an interview on Today Tonight um, who came out to one of our training sessions and they did an interview with me and it was very negative focus. So um, I could tell exactly the, the way they were going because the questions they were asking was um, focused around the uniform and that kind of thing. Um, but again, I just answered with exactly what I just told you before. And then I read some comments um, on the, <laughs> it come up, I think it come up on Facebook or something. And people just like to have a dig. Like I was, I, I was 25. That's right. I know because this person wrote um, Lisa Fife, 25, bull shit um more like 37 I was like, you're <laughs> kidding um and like I think from then you just learn that whatever people are gonna write is their own opinion I know I'm not 37 I definitely don't yeah. think I looked 37 then um, but like, 100% yeah. you do not <laughs> the comments that people make and things and people's opinions and that they they can have those and um I just think often people's opinion is a reflect or when they voice them is a reflection of of them and quite possibly their miserable life. <laughs> and that is a great takeaway right there, you know, that people's reactions are often reflective of themselves and what's going on. So when people say something about you or your business or what you're trying to do, you know, when you've got a growth mindset and you're trying to pull away from um, from the crowd and do something different, there are always people pulling you back, again, whether it's in business or, or life or entrepreneurship, whatever. Yeah. And their reactions are about themselves, about how what you're doing makes them feel about themselves. It's never actually about you as a person, whatever they say to you, you know, that, that's yeah, definitely. My, um, my take on it. So, all right, in relation to starting the F45, because that was a big a big step, are there lessons that you have learnt in your career as an athlete, regardless of what sport it was, that you have, that have served you well um, owning the business and running it successfully? And second question would be, it's, it was a big commitment. I mean, I researched years ago, you're looking into um, getting to an F45 myself. It's quite a quite a large financial commitment. Did you have any fears? What were they and oh, what did you do to overcome them? So I'll answer number two first. Um, basically, the story, you're going to laugh at this, the story of me, or, or me, and I always say me, Josh, my partner, owns it with me, but he does his own stuff and um, he just is basically my maintenance guy um, if I need something fixed. Good to have one of those. Um, <laughs> but it's us, but I I'd usually say me. Um, I, the story came about of me owning F45 is I was back home in Adelaide Hills and a couple of friends of mine, one of my friends of mine messaged me and said, we've just opened this new gym. When you're home, come and have a training session. And I went and trained there. I think it was, I think I trained there twice. And the second time I just got chatting to one of their PTs and it came up in conversation. She's like, why don't you open one down there? And literally from the time that I walked out that door, I found a, a, a contact email and I was, I asked, I emailed them. I was on the phone, on speakerphone, driving home to Mount Gambia and I'd already put a reservation on the territory because it was available and I knew that once the territory has gone, it's gone. So I found out that the territory was available. So it was um, a fully refundable deposit that went on. So I knew, one, there's no risk there um, because it's like if whatever reason you decide you can't do it or financially you can't, then they just refund your money and the territory goes back, um, back in their hands. And then I got home and I was like, right, Josh, this is what we're doing. <laughs> it's good because I was so confident because Mount Barker, I knew um, – is it that is, was a really is a really successful successful F45. Um, I knew that Mount Gambia had a less socioeconomic status, but had more people. So I knew that it would work. I just I just knew. Um, and basically, we went to the bank the next day or the the Monday as soon as I possibly could, and they said that we well we weren't prepared to we did hadn't been necessarily saving or anything. So that week we sold Josh's Harley and we bought it. <laughs> so. Um, I basically didn't do too much research into it because I just knew I I knew I wanted it basically. So that, that is cool. that, and that is why you love that Richard Branson quote, you know, yeah, about saying yes, it out opportunity. Later. But the amazing thing here is the opportunity wasn't 
presented to you in a way that we often think an opportunity will be presented. You think, okay, someone's going to go, hey, I've got this opportunity for you. Do you, are you interested? But that's not the way it happened for you. You actually created the opportunity for yourself yeah. just yeah. from a small so, comment. Obviously, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's recognising those opportunities when they come along. And um, I think, yeah, recognising something like that and then deciding are you going to do it or not. Um, and for us, I knew financially it was going to be hard because we didn't plan for that. Um, and we definitely hit some very, very tough times along the way where I had to do um, a lot of the work myself. So our building was is huge and it's got big five metre walls. Like I had to get this special paintbrush and I painted paint roll. I painted the whole place twice myself, like at two o'clock in the morning because Josh was working away. And there was stuff that we had to do ourselves and that that and just had to make it work um, because we we're at the point where financially wise to get it off the ground. Um, yeah, it was a little bit touch and go there for a bit, but I knew building our member base before we'd even open that after that initial two week free trial was over and these people are all going to sign up, we were fine. And within a few, not even a couple of months, we were breaking even. So um, I just, I just, I just knew. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I've got good instincts with things and a gut feeling with anything in my life. Like I just I always know when to say no to an opportunity or I just it doesn't feel right. And this, I just, I knew in deep down in every every part of me that it was going to work. So it was just, yeah, just doing it. That is um, incredible and it's totally inspirational. And if you're listening, go back and just listen over this last little bit that Lisa has shared in relation to going and trying out a training session at the F45 in Mount Barker to jumping in the car. Like what was that time frame, Lisa, from when you did the workout to when you got in the car and drove home and put a hold on the territory? Just to put it into perspective, what was that time frame? Probably an hour. One Maybe hour. Maybe not even that. <laughs> One hour, you saw a potential opportunity and turned it into your opportunity and a completely yeah. life-changing decision. So not only have you changed your life and done what it takes, this woman has absolutely done what it takes to make a success of her goal, her opportunity, which is incredible because people often say they want something, but are they willing to do what it takes? So I actually did a video on this today because uh, of a conversation I had with someone, right? We say we want success, but... Do you want it enough to feel so tired and exhausted like you did at two o'clock in the morning and do what needs to be done to not watch the damn Netflix series? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that, right? Like, you know, sometimes I'm like, yep, I just need to chill for a little bit. But if you say you truly want the goal or the thing that you're trying to achieve, you've got to put the work in and you've, you've got to make sacrifices. And sometimes that means saying no to things that you'd like to say yes to. So what did you have to say no to? What sort of sacrifices did you make, Lisa? Yeah, so, um, sorry, just going back before I go on to this, I think you have to find something you're passionate about. You can't have, you can't do that if it's something you're not passionate about or you won't do it. So for me, um, you know, I've always spent time in gyms and exercise is hands down me. And this style of F45 training for me is, it, it was, I'd never done it before. And as soon as I'd done it, I was like this, I love this. Um, and it's not for everybody. So that, yeah, for someone else, they may not, um, may not have that opportunity might not have come out but you have to find something that you're passionate about um to do that because yeah otherwise you're not going to be up at two o'clock in the morning painting walls <laughs> you're not going to do what it takes right? not, yeah but um the sacrifices at that time um that we had to make and even still um maybe not so much now but so josh had to work away even more um because we needed more money coming in because i actually was working at another gym um when um i'd done my um personal trainers course through them and i was working as a pt and then this opportunity came up and um i had to leave that job um, for conflict of interest um which of course makes sense um and then yeah i had to get a job in hospitality um I just had to get a, find a job that was something that I would they would take me on for four or five months that wasn't that they didn't want me for a long time because it was literally just I needed to still be bringing money in as well. So um, having that um, second job, so it was working nights, um, and so when I'd finish there is when I'd go to the gym and then I'd be working all day at the gym, um, getting it going as well. So I think the actual setup of F45, apart from aside from that painting and stuff, like our building is huge and it's a lot bigger um, than a lot of others. So a lot of like people don't have to actually do that, but what the work came for me was after we opened. So I was working 16 hour days every single day. Um, like, yeah, there was a time there where I accidentally slept in 
um, left one of my personal trainers hanging in the morning at five o'clock in the morning with a class full of 36 people. Um, but you le- I've never done that again after that, I don't think. Um, but yeah, it was, it's been so much sacrifice at the start of just not, um, events, anything like that, but that's okay because I love, loved and I still do love being there we've been open over two years now and being there every time um that I'm there I just love it it's awesome that's so wonderful to hear and you know you, you did make sacrifices and you did do the work I mean well the first thing you did was sell the bike um before I go on to the next question oh yeah sorry how, how did Josh take it <laughs> yeah how, how did that I mean I'm, I'm assuming that it was a sacrifice was it a sacrifice for you maybe it was a sacrifice for him I don't know yeah look no okay so it was a sacrifice for him for us um, but he, once I told him about this idea and this opportunity, um, he trusts me and he knows that I'm a real go-getter and he would trust me with anything. So I've got another business venture as well that we can talk about after that I've got in the pipeline. Um, but yeah, so I guess it was just something that's a material, you call it a materialistic thing that at the time it was also coming into, I think we purchased it in, we got a hold of everything in around April, May. So it was coming into winter when he wouldn't be riding it anyway. Um, and look, he just said, let's just do what we've got to do. And it just allowed us to have that, um, that, um, what do you call it? A deposit, um, to be able to, because what happens is when you, um, put a, ter- a reservation on a territory, if there's someone else who wants it. So what I was, the stressful part was, was it actually took us quite a while to get the bank loan and the money that we needed to do it because of all the, the paperwork and, um, a lot of things we had to do. It was, it was, it was when the banks were really cracking down as well. So it was incredibly hard to get a loan. And so we just knew if we did that, we would be in a lot better position. And I just said to him, look, let's work hard now and then you'll be able to get a new one down the track. That hasn't actually happened yet. Um, but a few of his friends don't have theirs. Yeah, Have's look, I think <laughs> if we had that money sitting there to just be like, yep, here, like you could go get one. But we are in the process of working on other things at the moment. So we're pretty rational in the sense that he just he, – and he's like, I don't need it right now. So, um, yeah, he'll definitely um, – get one and then not Sounds doing this like in the future. Sounds like a matter of but short-term sacrifices for a long-term gain. 100%. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, definitely. And it just really, a Harley is one of those things like we live in Mount Gambia and beautiful weather is few and far between. So like even when it's summer, it could be blowing an absolute gale and it's not like you're just in a city or, or open road where it's actually really nice to ride along like it is. It's, a, it's harder to find those days. So yeah, it wasn't um, something we had to even discuss for a period of time. It was just like, no, let's do this. And that's how we're going to get from that little stepping stone. Well, I love that you've everything. got a be- obviously a beautiful um, relationship and such a supportive relationship, which unfortunately a lot of people don't. So all you single people out there listening to this, you know, be picky and choosy about what you want in a relationship. And this is just like a little side note. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Did you ever feel like giving up? Were there ever moments when you were doing this where you went, oh, my God, like do, do I really want to keep doing this? Um, no, because I was so passionate about it still am, um, that, I mean, I've had those thoughts now because I think because I have been so tired and there's been times where I haven't been able to physically get to the gym and put my time into it and some things have gotten to me and I've just gone, should I just sell it? <laughs> but that's that, because you're a mummy of an 11 month. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but no, in no, I just, yeah, I, I, I still do and I just believe in the F45 model and I, I just, yeah, if, I mean, there's so many more um, – similar things popping up now and and that's great because competitions come black there's always going to be something that's going to be going to be better but f45 if um anyone listening who knows the bat like the ins of an f45 like the the company is amazing i have massive fomo right this second because the conference is in las vegas at the moment um the world conference and i was so close to going but what happened was just before they announced that it was in vegas i had booked a women's business retreat to Fiji. Um, I'm going in October for four nights. And it was just an expense that I was going to have to throw on top to go to America, try and get in and out within a few days because with Huey it would have been really hard. But, yeah, it was just, yeah, something I've got massive foam about. So the company, the, the work that they do behind the scenes is amazing and the development that's coming out of that company. So, yeah, I just knew that from the get-go. So, no, I didn't have any time where... Well, that's wonderful. Just sort out giving up. <laughs> wonderful to know, and I think that probably goes back to what you pointed out in relation to your passion, making sure that whatever it is that you're going to dig your heels in and work hard for is something. And you'll make you it work. About. Like yeah. you've got to put the work in, and you can't just expect things to just fall into your lap. And there has been times where I have really struggled and not been able to put my time into the business, and and we have hit little flat spots, and that's and um 
it's a hundred percent because I'm not building the business. So when I'm stuck out um, and not working on it, so I'm so lucky now. I've got nine of us that work there. Um, I don't um, physically have to roster myself on for any classes anymore. I still like to be there if I can, but I need to be building the business and working on it. And you just can't do that if you're not passionate about it because you've got no drive to do that. And that is gold right there to be able to work for for the entrepreneurs out there and the ones who are very successful. The mentors that I've had, they say the same thing. You know, you need to be able to work on the business, not always in the business. Otherwise, you're essentially in, you know, you've just created yourself um, another J-O-B. Yeah, basically, because my time now is just so valuable over that day, Um, especially like I haven't actually put Huey in daycare yet. I haven't had to. Um, I wouldn't mind having a day where I just know that I'll definitely be able to to have an appointment, to do appointments and that kind of thing, but so lucky because I can bring him with me. But he's a bit of a pain when he's there as well because it's like a playground in there. And you kind of got to keep your eye on him. I'm that. <laughs> yeah, the staff and the, and the clientele will probably do Oh, on. they love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're very, very, very lucky in that sense. But, yeah, it's my time to be to roster myself on for a four-hour shift. That's a huge chunk out of my day and energy as well because you're potentially dealing with over 100 people or around 100 people in that time slot and that takes a lot of your energy to be – chatting to all of them and um, being inspiring to them and, yeah, it takes it out of you, that's it? for sure. So that, that's a really good place to start with talking about the lives you've changed, right? So going back to this opportunity that you saw, then created and chased and then sacrificed and worked hard for, it's changed your life. But how many lives have you changed? I go on and on about it, change one life, change many. So because you made a massive change and chased something in your life, how many lives have you impacted through the clientele and the people that you have put through challenges and coached over the last two years? Yeah, so, oh, I couldn't even count. Um, We really um, have found that uh, I feel so lucky to have opened an FW5 or just a business in general into a regional community because it's something that when we opened, a lot of people were like, wow, this is what the cities have. (laughs) And so it was like... (laughs) Um, I totally get that. Like it's something that usually you wouldn't, um, sometimes you wouldn't see down to see somewhere like that. And we've created an amazing community there. So our last challenge, we've our seventh challenge. So um, we run four challenges a year. Um, and this is, we've just gone into our seventh. And I think we had 137 people um, sign up to our last challenge, which is incredible. And we generally have over a hundred. I think there's been one that was um, a little less and, um, yeah, and over that time, like, the amount of people who have either lost weight, um, changed their mental health, just changed their lifestyle in general. I've got a lady who's become a, um, a good friend of mine who um, had or has Crohn's disease and she ended up having a, um, an operation done. And when she came to us, she was very limited in what she could do because she'd been um, cut open, had this huge operation. And I can't remember how many – it had been quite a few months and her wounds weren't healing and – then she started really slow with us and once she started eating healthier and exercising, her wounds closed up and she has completely changed her life. Um, and people like that, like I don't – that's no testament to me at all. That's just her getting um, on that healthy um, fitness and, and healthy lifestyle. But if we didn't bring F45 to Mount Gambia, there's just probably a lot of people that I do wonder where they would be. Um, so to just be able to bring such an awesome program that is so easy for people to um, inject themselves into um, – yeah, it's not necessarily anything that I've, that's me personally, but just the business as a whole, um, people have really latched on too well. And to have over, yeah, 100 people do a challenge, you, you're you just changing people's lives every and single day. Like yeah, you consistently. Yeah, consistently. From, from my knowledge, um, you've had more than 100 people per challenge for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, <laughs> as far as like the, the F45 challenges go, like we don't, fo- like I couldn't tell you how many kilos as a, as a, um, Jim, we've lost it or anything like that because individually we put so much work into. So I pay my employees um, extra to – we have teams where they're um, looked after by our PTs and they've got goal-setting folders and we really delve into um, their journey um, and that as well. So there's a lo- there is a lot of work that goes into every individual and why our challenges have been so successful now is – because we're not just focusing on um, that weight loss um, journey. So anyone who's been a member with us from the beginning are still focusing on that consistency and, and what goals they can set um, that, that aren't a weight loss goal. So, yeah, to have those numbers through those challenges, the, package. the consistency and, and changing a lifestyle for the long term. So because a lot of people think eight weeks a, weight, a challenge or a weight loss challenge is just, yeah, to lose weight, but we don't focus ours on that. We focus it on eight-week blocks like I – try and do them but I'm honestly the worst person at doing challenges myself my energy goes elsewhere to everybody else but 
focusing on just an eight-week block, um, and that can just be maintenance. It can be putting on muscle. It can be losing weight. There's just so many different goals that people have. So that's why, I, yeah, why we're so successful at what we do. I think um, a really great point is that, you know, you're helping people, you're positively impacting people's lives and you're helping them to positively impact their own lives through the changes that they're making to support the goal setting, all of that sort of stuff. So I just want to say thank you and congratulations because I can only imagine the amount of lives that you've managed to change. Each person that you help change their life in one way or another, whether it's weight loss or or um, personal um, belief in themselves, how that affects other people in their life and that they come into contact with in that beautiful ripple effect. So um, wonderful, wonderful job that you're doing there, um, Lisa. Uh, I want it's to go a back good, to a good feeling. Question. Yeah, it is a good feeling, isn't it? Definitely. I bombarded you earlier with a question and then another question. So I just want to go back to that first question that I did. Baby out. brain probably forgot about it. Oh, no, I do it all the time. So um, I'm just too excited to ask you too many things, right? <laughs> um, in terms of your athletic career, what lessons and what uh, yes, you learned, disciplines one. that you have, that have served you well in life and business and chasing these goals? What has transferred well from the, the life of an athlete to the life of a business owner? Yeah. So there's definitely a few um, that I um, can think of. Um, comfort zone, 100% number one. Um, definitely to always keep going um, and not be afraid of failing because if you are afraid of failing, you're not going to have a go um, and learning from any failures along the way. So um, there's always going to be something that goes wrong and adversity and dealing with things along the way is what's going to teach you and build your character to keep going um, along the way. Um, teamwork is a huge one. Um, I've always been a natural leader as well. So I think team sports are one of those things that teach you how to always work um, within a team. And I think um, just off the top of my head, positivity is a huge one and optimism and just being optimistic that what you are doing is going to work or, um, yeah, just having that positive attitude um, all the time or as much as you possibly can is always going to work for you as well. They are really, really wonderful points and some of them we've touched on through this interview. Um, with positivity, I know you take it in your stride and that's just a part of who you are and I'm much the same, but for someone who wants to get more positivity and optimism in their life that maybe you're coaching, what would you say to them? How would you recommend that they do that if they feel quite negative or have a lot of negative stuff and people around them? What are your tips for that? Um, I think you have to change um, – you have to change something. So if you're in a negative state, you have to change something to get out of that. So, and you have to really work out what that is. Um, for some people, it's littler things. For some, it's really big. Like if someone's really unhappy in their job, but can't get out of that for whatever reason, like they've got to change something else um, to, to bring some positivity in. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that once you start changing little things along the way, then yeah, things will get better. And particularly with exercise, like oh, I'm such a firm believer, like if I don't, exercise for a period of time my attitude sucks <laughs> so um to get myself back in the gym will give me um get those good endorphins and that going but in terms of if someone needs more positivity they really have to change something and work out what that is in their life that that is bringing them that negativity so if it if it is that they are overweight then obviously um changing that is going to be their first step but everyone's negativity comes from somewhere different it could be their home life and it, it could be their work life and it yeah could be their social life so figuring out what that is and just doing something different I just think you've just got to yeah mix it up beautiful um I like how you said you know changing when you start changing the little things you can yeah. start basically have a snowball effect so we get that you may hate, hate your job or maybe even your relationship and it's not something that you um, want to can feel like you you can actually change at the time but what can you change? What can you do differently in your life that will positively impact it? So, Definitely. Lisa, um, it has been amazing. Where can people follow you? Please let them know, and I will put it in the show notes as well. Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned that I use Instagram, but I don't actually post that much, but you're welcome to go have a look at my photos. That I you do can go post. connect with Lisa, send her a message, <laughs> tell her how, you know, how something on here that you've listened to has, has affected you or has given you food for thought. Yeah, so my Instagram is such as five seven, um, all just one word. Um, you'll find me on there. I don't use anything else really. <laughs> Beautiful. I'll, I'll pop the details down there. Do you have a parting message for our listeners? Um, I guess just as a whole, everything that we've talked about, like if you want something or you want to make something happen, um, 
and you want it bad enough, you will you will make it happen. There will be risks, but you really do have to, um, I guess, take a chance to make it change. So, yeah, that's entirely up to you um, to make that change. Take a chance to make a change. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much. It has been no amazing. Worries. You're amazing and inspirational. We're out. See you later, guys. Have a wonderful Thanks day, night, me. morning. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the show. I truly hope you have found it beneficial and have taken some value from it. Hopefully, a lot. If you did, please, please share this show with anyone you feel may need to hear it. I would also absolutely love if you would take a minute or two to review this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whichever platform you happen to be listening to it on. With your help, we can accomplish my mission to positively impact 10 million lives. That would be so awesome. Now, if you want to connect with me or my guests on other platforms, or if you want to send me an email with questions or ideas of guests to interview, please check out the show notes. I am so incredibly grateful to have had your time today, and I can't wait to have you on the next episode. Have a great day.